Cheers. Cheers. I'm really excited to talk about Ghost World. Me too. What a great film. You know about the end of the film where Norman says that, you know, since my life has gone completely to shit, things are starting to look up. I thought it was Seymour who said that. Did I say Norman? Yeah. Oh yeah, Norman's the old guy. Yeah, on the bench. On the, bu- on the bus. Who gets yeah. on the bus eventually. So this is it's Ghost- like an old relic. Yes. Ghost World. So, we just finished watching Ghost World. Do you want to give like a little rundown of it? <sighs> yeah, in a nutshell. It's hard for me to like sum it up because to me it just is so similar to my own experience being like that age. Yeah. Being 17 and just wandering around, you know, in this horrible limbo state, waiting for something to happen, just so bored, um, and just kind of pervasive cynicism and mm-hmm. horrible outfits and terrible lipstick choices. Beige lipstick. Beige lipstick. Bile Bile coloured lipstick. I think that's te- that's the technical yeah. green that she wears in that scene. I don't know, you give it, I think you should give it a rundown. Because you introduced me to this film. I'm kind of horrified that I hadn't seen it. Yeah, because the moment I saw it, I Because I thought, love Thora Birch oh, yeah, This is movies. actually Nell Walker, just in a movie. <laughs> it literally is. Like, honestly, when I saw it, I just thought, this is so... This so encompasses a moment, you yeah. know? A moment in time, and the film is kind of a perfect distillation of that horrible adolescent loneliness. Yeah. And the in-betweenness, you know, between school finishing and the next stage of your life starting. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's... Um, it's a very lonely film. It is. It's a very angsty film. Yeah. So there are two friends. There's Thora Birch playing Enid. 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 And then Scott there's... Scott Johansson. I love how you say Johansson. I thought that's how you say it. Johansson. Johansson? Johansson. Johansson. Yeah. Like Yo- Johansson Sebastian yeah, Bach Yo- or... Yeah. Right. Okay. But isn't it? No, it's Johan. Yeah, I'm, I'm fucking up. So <laughs> Scarlett know. Johansson <laughs> plays the friend of Thora Birch. Yeah, and she's and so like, it's Enid and Rebecca. Yes. And they're both at the beginning. They're just like really mean to everyone. And high school just, outcast. High school outcast. Types. Kind of very misanthropic. Yeah. Very cynical and very similar. Although Enid is definitely more cynical and sarcastic and nihilistic, I think, than the Scarlett Johansson character. Would yes, agree? but they're both aimless and a little bit depressed at the beginning in their own unique way. But I think it's just because they're in high school, they've got some form of how structure. They f- how they fit into a society. Yeah, like they've got that structure of high school to yeah. push against, to rebel against. But once they're taken, that's taken away, they're like, oh fuck, now what do I do in my life? Like, I'm just empty now. Well, yeah, and also they're sort of, suddenly they're just being aimlessly bitchy. Mm. You know, at the beginning, it's like when there's the graduation ceremony and the party yeah. and stuff. It's and, like, and the girl's got the like the whole headgear. Neck yeah, brace yeah, the girl who's been in a car accident. He's like, I know now not to be tempted by drugs and <laughs> alcohol. And then Thora Birch goes, "I think I liked her better when she was a an alcoholic crack addict." Yeah, yeah, but, and and now she's all little Miss, um, little Miss Perfect. Yeah, now she got hit by a car. Yeah, it's funny because Mean Girls had a, a character that got hit by a car, didn't, wasn't that? Isn't it, it Regina George at the end of that movie gets? She yeah, has I'm like sure a. Someone at the beginning had the whole headgear. Really? There's always someone in an American high school film. I feel who got hit by a car. Who gets hit by a car and, and has a head brace. Funky head brace thing. Yeah, or there's always someone called like um, Eunice who has like braces that is like headgear. You know that '90s horrible American headgear that's just so hideous. That's a curse for a kid in high school. Yeah. But yeah, once the structure of High school is taken away once they can't fit into that sort of society and microcosm. They're mm. kind of a bit, they're lost. a bit screwed, yeah. a bit lost. And it's already a kind of dead end suburban town. It's very like nothing ever changes. There's kind of the the constant mm. ongoing decor in the background, which you just get the illusion that these people who are sitting in this diner have literally been sitting in the same diner for. 50 years yeah. and nothing's changed I was trying to think what the title means like what Ghost World means yeah. and I think that's what it is because you know at the very end of the film she's on a bus and she's the only one on the bus yeah and you've and got the blue no ghostly the light street apart from the bus driver and her it's so eerie and it's like fuck where where is the universe there's no one else there apart from her yeah it's total limbo and even the fact that you've got you've got these like symbolic characters kind yeah. of set up as 
the people are like furniture in this town. You've got Norman who just sits on that bench and he's become part of the, the decor. Yeah. You've got the trousers that, you know, someone's left on the sidewalk and they're literally there in every shot. Yeah, that I want to talk about that because that's a really yeah. interesting little trope thing. So there's a bunch of scenes in this film. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. There's a bunch of scenes in this film where they're walking along the, the street by the yeah. bus stop and there's just this manky pair of jeans on the ground. That and have like, it, been trodden over so exactly, five million I mean, times. I remember the, the, the little town I grew up in. There was always, like, by the bus station, some piece of clothing, like it was like a, like <laughs> a, glove. a, a beanie hat. A child's glove. That's the saddest thing glove. when you see, like, a, one tiny sock yeah. on the pavement. And you yeah, say, oh, and it's, like, a bit manky yeah. and, like, some rats been gnawing at it. But it's stuck to the pavement. It's yeah, just fused with the, yeah. with the ground. And in, and in Ghost World, they walk past the same pair of jeans. Yeah. And it's like, no one gives a shit enough about that town to actually clean it up. And it also implies that the owner of the pair, in, the pair of jeans... Is so nihilistic and depressive about life as they don't care about retrieving their pair of jeans, or even they just don't exist anymore. But also the idea of how how did those jeans get there in the yeah. first place? Like who loses a pair of jeans? It's so absurd. It is. Absurd. You know, glove makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and then what else have you got? There's the. It's very nostalgic. There's like heavy, ongoing kind of references to you know she's obsessed with seventies records. Yeah. It opens with a seventies, the seventy seven Bollywood. Song is it seventy seven yeah, seventy eight? It's weird that that song is in the beginning and the end because it makes it has no like connection to the rest of the film for me. It's, there's the fifties diner as well. There's a lot of looking back and it's very stagnant. It's like the idea of looking forward. There's no. It's kind of anti progressive. Yes. As a film. Yeah, because even the guy like the guy the the quickie mart with the nunchucks. Yeah. So you have this uh, the the local store. The Brad Renfro character who works there says, you know, that guy's in here more than I am. Exactly, yeah. And he's the, the guy who's like a knucklehead yeah. who walks in with no t-shirt on and like eats beef jerky out of, <laughs> off the counter yeah. and walks around with nunchucks. And a porno tash. And a, yeah. And um, and he's at the beginning of the film. But he's totally and 70s. And he looks exactly the same. It's not like he's changed or developed. He, he looks exactly the same, but also he, uh, in terms of like the nostalgic kind of references, I, as we were re-watching the film, I was just noticing how... 70s and drab the color scheme is there's a bit of a kitschy neon thing going on as well yeah and obviously you have all of thora birch's ridiculous outfits which, which are just, wonderful and hideous in equal measure yeah. but also amazing because i remember being 17 and not really knowing how i wanted to dress and just experimenting with like every single kind of color hair, yeah mm-hmm. hairstyle and color and she has like 10 pairs of glasses that she switches between yeah and they're it, all uh, random sunglasses yeah. and, and she's like you know she's playing dress up and you've got the scarlett hansen character who really wants them to move in together and sort of get an apartment mm. and she's sort of playing she's matures very quickly and that results in her kind of floating away from the friendship but you've got thora birch very resistant to change yeah and kind of very adverse to change yeah, it's it's interesting how and holding holding on to the past is a big is a big theme. You've got Seymour holding on to those old records. You've got Thor Birch holding on to her childhood yeah. belongings. In it's her like room. she's so poor, but she can't keep a job because she she contains she her can't contain her like anarchist outbursts. Yeah, so she can't hold a job down for longer than today. Yeah, so she has a yard sale with all her stuff, all her crap, all like, of her childhood, childhood uh, rubbish, which, break break. which is kind of, it's interesting because it's really tragic when you see all that stuff in her bedroom because you're like, oh, this is a person who's who's graduated from high school and now has no need for any of this, like, kid stuff. Yeah, but, but it's, it's still but, but she's her. But she's so adverse to change and it's interesting actually because that's a big conflict in Enid, that she, she kind of dupes herself and mm. her friend into believing that she's you know she's progressive she's forward thinking yeah, yeah she can't wait to move on and you know get out of here but at the same time oh god i hate high school i want to yeah, yeah 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 but she's uh she's terrified she's terrified of the idea of her friend going off and getting a job because it means that something's changing yeah she's terrified of impermanence even though she sort of says that she hates the town that she grew up and she wants to get out it is very tragic though that um, the fact that their friendship slowly starts to disintegrate. Because you, when you see them at the beginning of the film, yeah, they are completely authentic in selling this idea of, like, 
these two people know have known each other since they're like five, and they're best mates, you know. Yeah, and they like sort they, of um, they sort of mirror each other even with their outfits. I mean, you know, they're both wearing the short skirts and the boots and the blouses. They've got almost identical yeah sort of dress sense, and they just bounce off each other. Yeah. And kind of banter, and then but as soon as they, they just slowly gra- start to lose that. Yeah, as soon as they graduate high school, and they they start to you have these random little scenes like them in the cookie mart, and them at the um, comic book shop, and the cafe, and loads of other places. That's hilarious, that's <laughs> And Enid is actually kind of amused and sort of entertained by all the random shit from her childhood, and is happy just yeah. like. But you almost think that's like her trying to cling on to clay, something. like but her trying to just hide. The fact that the future's coming, she has no idea how to prepare for it. Well, yeah, and she also doesn't really understand what it is to be, like, a woman yet. You know, she's kind of, she flaunts her sexuality. She tries, she's very precocious. She dresses in a very, towards yeah. the end of the film especially. But she doesn't really know what to do with herself. She's very uncomfortable in her own skin. Which is partly yeah. why she keeps changing her outfit so much, I think. And trying to change her look. Yeah. She's trying to figure out like what kind of what kind of chick she is. She doesn't have a yeah. reference really for it. And she's you know, she's a cartoonist. So again, she's got sort of pure old mm. humour and it's all linked to kind of kid you know, it's like kid humour. Yeah. Yeah. And like I love all the, the little scenes at the beginning where in the in the background of every shot of Enid enjoying herself like muck around with all this childhood crap. Yeah. You've got Scarlett Johansson <laughs> um, in the background, like lying on the sofa as if she's like almost a dead corpse. She's like melted into like, the she has day no <laughs> bones in the body. She's yeah. like, ah, I love go, that, that her whole off. posture like, is hilarious. Like yeah. the way they both walk around the, the streets, how they just randomly pick like two people to follow because they think they look funny they're yeah. so bored that that is like you know it's just the lowest form of entertainment yeah like pouring salt on a table and then like in a moving diner it around and moving it around and, yeah. and that's you, you see films where they show someone in prison and they're so bored they're doing like yeah like it's it. yeah and it's for trying to sort of find joy from like the minutia the Enid character is incredibly cruel oh, she yeah. has this cruel streak and yeah. she sort of becomes kind of sadistic because she really is just having fun at the expense of other people. Yeah, I mean, that's how she meets that's the only Yeah, and that's the only way that she can entertain herself or find some kind of meaning in her life. Is yeah. She's defining herself through taking the piss out of other people. Yeah. And that's how she meets... Seymour. Played by Steve Buscemi. Buscemi. You know, as the, the funny-looking guy out of Fargo. Yeah, he's yeah. got crazy teeth and his eyes just pop out. Oh, yeah. He's got such an interesting face, though. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, he's perfect for this role. Yeah. Explain what happens with the plot when she meets, how she meets him. Okay, so... what happens. Because when you were first telling me about the movie on the phone, you really sold it to me (laughs) with this bit. I was like, okay, I'm going to... Oh, about how they they look up the Lonely Hearts Hearts column in the paper. Yeah. And um, they read this guy saying like, oh, I saw you in the airport and um, I helped you pick up your bag or something like that. And, uh, you I drop your guy. contact lens. Yeah, and yeah. no, I, I was the guy in the green jumper and yeah. whatever. And you were the blonde in the red dress. Or... Was it just me or was there a connection? Did we have a moment in there? Yeah. And they're reading this like article who is from a person who actually is deep down striving for like adult human contact. Like he really Yeah, he to, desperately like... wants connection yeah. with someone else. And they're just He's a lonely old reading kid, basically. this and going like, God, how pathetic yeah. is this guy? That's and so it's... horrible. And it's about so it. sad because that's so true. Like there yeah. are loads of people like that in the world. Oh yeah. And um and this is like the, the, the Jordan Peterson thing about um how humans are unique to animals because humans understand torture. Cruelty. Cruelty. They yeah. understand how to like get to you because they understand suffering. They understand your own <laughs> suffering. Yeah. So therefore, you can inflict that Inna- suffering on, Inna- yeah. on other people. If you understand what people are afraid of or whatever, you can torture someone. Yeah. And that's a horrifying thought, but that's true. But it's, I mean, it's it's why Homo sapiens won out over Neanderthals because we had the ability to talk about abstract things with language. Well, that's a theory. I don't. I'm not. I'm not no, but we could talk about things that. like God and the law, and you're not entirely sold. No, I mean, no one knows if Neanderthals were able to have a religion. But they have yeah. they have better tools than us and stuff. I think they were like better equipped, but they all died out because we had the ability to like talk about abstract concepts. I thought it was a case that we figured. I out think I don't know the exact farming. science. Don't take my word on it. I, I thought it was the fact that uh, um, sapiens figured out farming quicker, and Neanderthals were the 
hunter gatherers, yeah. and the farmers, because obviously farming, you just naturally outnumber everyone else, and the population just boomed, and they just outnumbered the Neanderthals and just um, like basically pushed them out. I thought that was how it went. I think it was, but also I think it was about language. I think it was about understanding complex. Okay. They could do, they had the ability to discuss or conceive of kind of abstract. Concept. I don't know how we got onto the. I, I guess it's a distinction an between humans and animals. Tangent. Yeah. Um, I don't know how we got onto that, but it is about the differences between people and uh, what distinguishes people from animals. And you're saying oh, it's uh, about like cruelty, understanding how, suffering, understanding suffering, and how these kids, like children, can have the potential to be unbelievably cruel. But I mean, I remember being in school. And I remember, you know, I I, I like yeah. every other kind of uh, loner, outsider, geeky artist kid. Yeah. I wasn't, you know, a popular kid. I wasn't a sporty kid. And these girls were just so... I mean, girls are so cruel. Yeah. I remember my... Um, Boys just punch each other. Yeah. But girls bitch I think and they gossip. When you're really, and... really little, you have the potential to be cruel. Because you kind of want to push you... people. Oh, yeah. Like my, um, my sister. Yeah. I remember a time when my dad... So I, I was probably about... Five or What's six. What's the age gap between you two? Like two years. Yeah. So my, I was about five or six. My sister must have been about four or five, four, three or four, whatever. And my dad's holding my sister in the butchers after school or whatever. Yeah. And so my sister's on my dad's shoulders, and I'm down like on. I'm standing up, and my dad's like holding my hand. Yeah. And he's in the queue for the butcher shop, and in front of us is a hideously obese woman, like really, really, really <laughs> this- big. Sorry, was this like your first fat shaming incident? Are what do you mean my young? first fat shaming incident? <laughs> We're in the butcher shop yeah. and my dad has my sister on his shoulders. And my sister has sort of, she's like the, into the first couple of years of speaking. So she's a fucking chatterbox. Yeah, she'll just say anything yeah, for anything. the fun of it. And my dad knows that my sister has clued into the fact that... Has clocked that there's... There's someone who doesn't look like yeah. us. Like morbid, like she must have weighed like 300 pounds or something. Oh, crazy. She's like huge. And she had a, like a tash and everything. It was, it was quite. Sad. She had a tash and everything. Yeah, I love that. Just tag that on. Anyway, <laughs> just to and add it in my dad injury. knows sort of what's coming, and he's trying to like maneuver my sister, so his head is in the way. He's out sister. of range. Yeah, and he's trying to like move maneuver, and my sister's trying to like grab yeah. all his shoulders and go like, oh, that's, that's a strange person. I need yeah. to look at them. Anyway, as they get to the the till in the butcher shop, my dad's about to order the thing, and the the, the fat lady's right next to us. And my sister points, puts out her little, like, three-year-old hand, oh, no. points at the lady and says, Daddy, look at that fat man. <gasps> and my dad's oh, like... Oh, no. God. That's yeah. just the worst. Yeah. But kids just do that. But they don't... The it's is, not that they lack a moral compass, so to speak, but, you know... Yeah, because that it, wasn't a three-year-old being cruel. That was just a three-year-old, like... A ch- well, it's a child noticing something that's a bit different from that. And, you know... Yeah. Kids do that. They kind of like they want to define everything that's in their surrounding environment. Yeah. Um, you know, it's how we how we learn. Yeah. But I mean, kids are kids are really cool. They'll just point at your face and be like, "You've got a zit." Like they won't. They're not going to care. Oh, yeah. They'll just be like, "Oh, there's something funny about your face. So I'm going to point it out." Yeah. You know, they don't have any qualms about. And the and also, yeah, it's totally like these characters don't hold back. Oh no. You know, they're they're basically you've got. Enid sketching to uh, customers yeah. at the diner and calling, and calling them, like, them Satanists, Satanists and sa- saying, suggesting to her friend that they should follow them. Yeah. And they're so bored that that is like a, a, f- a good day for them. Yeah. It's like, a good day out when they today, follow what, some random what, people What are we going to do today? It's like, what are we going to do today? Oh, we're just going to follow two people and laugh at them and yeah. point at them. It's so hollow. Yeah. You kind of understand they just want something to happen. And then obviously... With the Steve Buscemi character, it's like Thor Birch just thinks something's happening. Yeah, something so, new so, is so, happening. So, so to clarify, um, Steve Buscemi yeah. is a man who puts this advert in the Lonely Hearts column, and Thor Birch in the Scarlet yeah. Johansson. What's her name? Scarlet Johansson. Rebecca. Rebecca. Her? Okay, Re- and Rebecca yeah. and Enid um, decide to call this person up and say like, "It was me. I was the one who yeah, saw you." Yeah, she prank calls him. Yeah, prank calls him up, and then they hide in the back of the diner and watch him come in. Yeah, it's a horrible, sadistic setup. It is, and it just lasts forever. And they forever. drag their friend, their um, 
Brad Renfro yeah, friend along. Josh. Yeah, Josh, and he's so just sort of repulsed. Yeah, that they'd be so horrible. It, it's funny that he is so repulsed at their behaviour. Yeah. And it's kind of ironic that he's the one who incurs the wrath of Seymour at the end, where Seymour finally figures out what's happening. And he goes to Josh and is like, fuck you, Josh, you were taking the piss out of me. And Josh is like, I don't even remember you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is so long ago. It's total misplaced yeah, anger. It yeah. is. But, um, so yeah, so Seymour t- t- turns up thinking that he's going to meet this um, the girl. The girl of his dreams. Oh, so sad. And, he's, he, and he sits there and he orders like a big glass of milk. So he, he's drinking this milkshake yeah. at the bar. And they're there for like what seems like half an hour. Well, they're, no, well, they're there until closing. Oh yeah, he really... sits there, for, and that's what's so awful about it. Is he sits? There... He's really convinced that she's going to show up. Yeah, and he sits there for a long time, and they're waiting, and they're like, Rebecca, Rebecca, <laughs> is saying, "I think we should stop this, guys. This is fucking cruel and creepy. I don't like this." See, that, that's the thing. And she... Enid is the one who's like, "No, I want to see this person." But that's the thing. Enid has no boundaries. Yes, and that's part of what gets her into trouble. It's not. I don't think it's that she doesn't have a compass, or that she's not aware of you know, what's moral and what's immoral. Mm. She's She just doesn't have any lines in her head preventing her from doing anything. Whereas Rebecca is... She has the freedom to be mean for now because yeah. she knows that soon, you know, she's going to be moving into an apartment starting, like, you know, the beginning of her adult life mm. and she's going to be working and stuff. So she she kind of has that, that freedom. Yeah. That feeling of freedom. Whereas uh, Thora Birch just trapped in her bubble of... And it's poisonous. Oh, yeah, it is. And she's a, she's a kind of toxic person. After they leave the diner, mm. Steve Buscemi is driving in his little shitty car out, and they follow him out. And Scarlett's like, yeah. we can't follow him. Let's not follow him. And Nina's like, yeah, let's follow him. Yeah, yeah. And he gets out of his car and he leaves the parking lot and then someone cuts him up. Yeah. And then he just like stops and like smashes the yeah, steering wheel with out. his hands and like screams in the car. He's, yeah, he's got really bad road oh rage. Oh my god. And it's so heartbreaking when you see that because it's like, that's he's real. like a lonely, angry man. That's real behaviour. People act like that all the time when they're in the cars and they like freak out because well, yeah, they're depressed kind of, about something. It, it kind they've of... been stood up for like an hour and a half. Yeah. Like, that's horrible. But you know what is so great about the film is it's an examination of the context of that kind of person that like, mm. you come into contact with so uh, regularly yeah. in life and you wonder like what the fuck happened to this person to make them behave like this yeah why aren't they smiling at me while they're serving me my pint and it's because their life is is Deep fucking empty down it's like an empty abyss hollow soulless void yeah so they they follow him out of the diner all the way back to his home. And I think they make a comment which is like, you know, let's just find out which apartment he lives in. Yeah. And they look through the mail of all the apartments and it, on that road. It's sort of Sherlock style, of, uh, like, you know, power of deduction yeah. kind of thing. So they look through one letterbox and like, oh, this is obviously like chick's so, mail. Yeah. And they <laughs> and look then through the other his like, letterbox. Psoriasis and Foundation. Yeah. The, 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 the Worldwide Psoriasis yeah. Foundation. And, this... and they're like, obviously. And it's like, it's like leaflets from collectors clubs from like random obscure. Yeah. Shit. Geek mail. Yes. Like subscription magazines. Mm. And... Does he live alone? No, he has that roommate, that kind of. He's a fat roommate. That fat, horrible, sort of oppressive roommate yeah. who's clearly not doing him any favours. Well, no. That's the really sad thing about this life, Seymour, is that no one in his life is doing him any favours. Yeah. When you think about it, it's like even his girlfriend later in the film, she's trying to twist him into being her rebound. Yeah. Enid's, like, just needs someone to talk to. Yeah, she's, she's sort of using him. Yeah. It's almost like a sort of... <laughs> it's like a geek fetishization. What's interesting, actually, about also the nostalgia thing is Seymour is obsessed with... He collects 70s records, specifically blues and ragtime and stuff like that, and is very sort of, like, technical about it and knows, you know, he's kind of a bit... Would you say on the spectrum? Oh, he's yeah, got to- totally obsessive kind of, you know, extreme lonely masculinity thing. Yeah. Um, assuming that Seymour is, let's say, in his forties. Yeah. Uh, the seventies, presumably, would have been when he was a teenager. Hmm. He's got like a teenage boy's room. He's got like a. Te- he's living with another guy, so that's like being roommates when you're like someone yeah. who's like that age shouldn't be living with like just another dude. There's something like he's trying to hold on to his adolescence. Well, I don't and know. And so because, is she. Because even when Enid goes around his house, mm. instantly it's like he recognises what he is and he's able to critique himself 
by saying yeah. like, why why would you? Well, he speaks think... very lucidly about. Yeah, it. yeah. So like Enid, when she sees his apartment, is really impressed with all of his like memorabilia and stuff. Yeah, and she's the... even jealous. Of you know, this. they go to the party and he says like, the record room is off limits to me. Yeah. Fuck oh. I'm not going to have anyone else snooping around my records. And she's like, yeah. oh, can I see them? And, it's this sort of like... and she kind of sees that as something cool about yeah. him. And it almost reminded me, do you ever see that film called 40 Year Old Virgin? Yeah. So Ages ago. Steve... Okay, so the guy in 40 Year Old Virgin, the main guy in 40 Year Old Virgin. Yeah. His apartment is so well organised and he has like every musical instrument and every collector's item and toy and like DVD and like framed manga posters yeah stuff like that just like a sort of collector obsessive yeah. and everything's in perfect order yeah because he's a virgin <laughs> which is kind of hilarious but also really like sad yeah that someone is still is living out that sort of teenage fantasy well it's not even a teenage fantasy it's sort of like this overdose of order and there's not enough chaos in your yeah. life. You need a little bit of like pizzazz and like interesting yeah. shit to happen whereas if it's well, just it's, all... yeah it's leaving nothing to chance yeah. You're, you feel out of control about your life, so you focus on this one thing that you can have, like, obsessive control over. Part of that sort of OCD temperament is it's some giving some order to the chaos of life that you can't predict. Steve Carroll. Steve Carroll. That's you got him. it right. I thought it was Steve Farrell. I'm like, no, Steve... that's Farrell no, is Farrell. the in that's... Bruges guy. Yeah. Seymour's room is a sort of shrine to, a shrine to his favourite blues... God, he's, he's got not like blues, it's not blues time blues. technically, and it only has 12 beats a minute. And all, <laughs> and all that, yeah, and it's, it's sort of really off putting to everyone but Enid. She's really taken with it, and I don't know why. I think I know why. Why? I think that okay, I don't know. As I was watching the film again, I started thinking about mirrors and kind of reflections, mm. and there's a lot of mirror imagery in the film. Yeah. I think at the beginning, she's got. Her best friend is kind of a mirror in some way. There's a twinning thing. You know, she sees mm. something. It, they see something in each other. Yeah. That's like this c- cynical quality mm. and like desire to just like Shit on be everything. anarchist. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's sort of their cause. And then I feel, I don't know, it's interesting the, the parallel between Enid's room, which is like her childhood bedroom that she hasn't yet left, but she's sort of too big for. And it has all the crap in it. It's almost like, you know, remember the film Juno? Yeah. And she's talking to the people on a burger phone. Yeah. And that's yeah, such yeah, a yeah. funny thing, but it's like, oh shit, this person is pregnant. She's yeah. going to have a baby. And she's got a burger phone. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but even... It's but, such a great little, like, condensing of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I don't know, like, Ina's kind of living in, like, a toy box. She's surrounded by all of these kiddie belongings that she's outgrown. Yeah. But there is still a kind of collector's... Obsessional. She's a hoarder. Think, yeah, she's exactly. Yeah. And then when she goes into Seymour's bedroom, she she sees she recognizes that quality in him as well. That he's a collector. That he hasn't been able to let go of things that yeah. he's been obsessed with for God knows how long. You know, it's his lifelong love is yeah. his music, and he's so uh, freakish about his records. Like she pretends to drop one of his records. Oh my God, I dropped it. And then and then and he, then he he sort of has, has a like a hernia. Yeah. Yeah. He's like really freaked out. It's interesting that. The moment he has someone else in that room, he's completely honest with, like, what it actually is. Because there's that line where he says, like, this isn't, like, you know, when Enid is impressed and she's, she says, oh, this is my dream room. I would love to have all this stuff. You must be the luckiest guy in the world. Yeah. And he's like, this isn't, this isn't great. It's like, what do you mean you can't connect with any other people in your yeah. life? So you collect all this crap around you. Yeah, to, like, to fill the void. Yeah. It was connecting to things rather than people. people. But but you're right. Like it's, he's, it's like he has this moment of lucidity. But that's what I mean. She's like a true mirror for him in some way. They kind of mirror each. Other. They kind of hold a mirror up at each other in mm. some way. And I think the thing that connects them is that they're both lonely. Yeah. They're both collectors to yeah. a certain extent and waiting for an excuse to let go of things that they're very stuck to. Yeah. They're both trying to preserve something. I think we need to open another beer. Yes. I'll, go, I'll do it. You, you carry on. Oh, yeah. So I wrote down, neither Enid nor Seymour can grow up. So yeah. just to reference the ghost word, the title again. They're ghosts because they're both perpetually stuck in adolescent belongings, behaviour, collected items, like yeah. friends. You know, you know in Fight Club? Yeah. Where he talks about how he's beca- he, he, he masturbates to Ikea stuff. 
Yeah, he, well, he just a catalog. He talks about like sitting on the toilet and just ordering <laughs> stuff. Yeah, and how he fills up his apartment full of like, what is the perfect dining cutlery set that defines me as a person and all that yeah. stuff. And it takes, which is a great comment explosion. on American kind of consumerist culture. Well, yeah, well. yeah, it, it takes like the whole thing to blow up for yeah. him to actually go. Oh, right, what actually do I give a shit about? Well, yeah, it's a rock bottom. Yeah, and like at the end of the film, Seymour says when he's seeing his therapist, it's like, yeah, it's funny that my when my life's turning to shit, actually. Yeah, it's like to... a near-death experience or something. Like, it has the same effect, but that's what it's going to take for them to let go. Like, it literally takes a moment of magical realism for, yeah. for the apparition of this bus to appear. You know, for the whole movie, you've got this guy, Norman, sitting on a bench waiting for a bus that... Hasn't run for like the last five years. It, it kind of reminded me of the scene in Forrest Gump. Obviously, it's completely different, but yeah, just because it's about old Cheers. people. Cheers. Just about old people about waiting old. for a um, bus. But that moment when they say like, um, Norman, like there hasn't been a, a, a bus on this street for two years. Yeah. And he's like, Yeah, well, you're wrong about that. Well, he says you don't know what you're talking about. Yes, that's <laughs> such a fucking creepy line. Where it's like, Well, it's, it's almost prophetic. You don't that line. know what. The and he says it in a way that you know that he's talking about. He's just basically saying, shut up, little girl. Yeah, you know, I'm an old man. I've been in this town for, you know, 50 yeah. years, probably. But it's funny how that comes across to them as like, oh, he's just this stupid, senile, senile mm. old man. Mm. But really, I think it was, is that like, he was justified in saying that because at the end, the bus does come. And Thora Birch is looking, she walked down the street past the, that manky pair of jeans again, <laughs> and sees him you know sitting at the bus stop again yeah and like, oh god that poor man and then the bus comes she's like oh fuck but it's there's lots of absurd things in this yeah. film like the bollywood thing and the, the basically the bollywood music at the beginning is the thing actually that connects enid with seymour because they trick their way into a like a garage record pop-up shop thing that he's doing yeah. with his friend and she sees his records and asks if he has any any uh, Bollywood records. That's how. That's how. Oh, that's, really? that's the first introduction. Ah, so that's why it but, has the Bollywood song at the beginning. Yeah, because she's for some reason obsessed with that. Song. And I love yeah. the fact that she's got that obsessive temperament too. Like she plays tracks over and over and yeah. over again. I mean, like like say, well, because one of the scenes is just in her flat in a room on a in, fainting like, couch. Yeah, on a fainting couch in a different outfit, yeah. with a different hair color, and different pair of sunglasses. Mm. And it's the same song playing, and then it stops, and then she gets up, puts the record back, plays it again, and then sits back down. And it's but that's a... a great that's a great metaphor for the whole film. Is that it's just like a track play? It's, this place is like on a loop. Yeah, you um, get that with a lot of dead end kind of suburb. Scarlet Rebecca's character. <laughs> Scarlet Rebecca is um like they 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 start to change and drift apart because she's actually trying to change her situation Yeah, she's in life. trying to break the she's cycle. She's trying to like, improve her lot in life by like getting a job and getting a flat and all that sort of stuff. And that's really interesting. Elaborate. Why is it interesting? Well, because they're so close at the beginning. And they both share the same goals. And But they, they're they both because they Do they? I don't know if they share the same goals. Oh, you think that if Enid so I, was I, left to her own devices, she would end up like Seymour? Yeah. And Rebecca, if she's left to her own devices, she'd end up like the... She'd do it anyway. I think actually, fundamentally, they have completely different desires actually and yeah. goals I think in some ways they're kind of the only shared quality between them is their meanness you know it's almost like they're, they're, they're friends because you know those friendships that you have with people who it's like you're kind of like alone but together you're just hanging out but you're both kind of you're not really engaging or connecting with the other person you're mm. kind of spending time alone but together and that's sort of what their relationship is. Yeah, because in high school it works, but as soon as they leave high school, it doesn't work. And I think it's something. I think it's yeah. saying like these two people are depressed, and if you have two depressed people hanging out together, they make each other more depressed. And also, because they end up hating each other, kind of. In their own... Well, Enid is very. She's got that typical defensive thing where she mm. kind of wants to oppress uh, Rebecca. Yeah, she's possessive and she's jealous. She doesn't want her to improve or, like, really do well. She just wants to keep her down there in the hole. Yeah. So they're both in the hole. Also a film that... Um, also a film that Thora, Thora Birch, Birch plays in. a sort of manipulative... She's always playing the sort of same... Oh, yeah, because that film... Manipulative with, teenage um, girl. And then there's American Beauty with, as well. With uh, who, who's the who's other actress in the hole? 
Kira. Kira Knightley. Kira. Yeah, Kira. because it turns out that Thora Birch is, the, is the, 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 yeah. the, um, the baddie. Spoiler! Spoiler! Uh, yeah, for, yeah, she, for the whole, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. She's, a, she's sort of... She's got... You know, she's got such a great quality. It's, like, so hard to play... She's got this psychotic thing, and I don't know what it is about her. Yeah, you could that does it so well. If you just saw a picture of her from like a, a screen grab from any of the films, yeah. you'd say, "Oh yeah, she's capable she... of murdering someone, yeah. definitely." Like... But why is that? I think it's weird because she looks like she looks like a cute little girl. Like she's got the kind of like you know chubby cheeks and like the kind of you know little bobby haircut, and she's yeah. kind of cutesy, but she's evil. Yeah, she doesn't look like a villain, but she always plays these kinds of villainous characters like a grown up um, Natalie Portman from Leon you know yeah like, Leon, if, yeah, yeah. like Leon 15 years in the future and Natalie Portman is a emotionally scarred psychotic person with a couple of pistols yeah you know but do you think that I was thinking of asking you this question all along the film do you think that Enid is a sociopath she seems to completely lack empathy yeah but you, you or is it just, she's, just is it just that she's emotionally stunted she can't move yeah, on. Yeah, because she has, like... She's so in her own head. Yeah, and, and, like, the first time we saw this film, I think you said something like how her dad was so not there. Yeah, he's weak. And, and weak and sort of pathetic and kind of, like, not there. But I think it's not... It is a bit more complicated then. It's like... Because there's a missing mum. And you don't know if the yeah. mum's uh, died or run off. Yeah. But either way... It's not just her that's been traumatised by that, it's obviously the dad that's been traumatised by that. Yeah, and it's affected them in sort of, per- sort of completely opposite yes. ways. And, and it's like, it's, it was kind of similar to, um, have you seen a film called Kick-Ass? Uh, yes, ages ago. Yeah, from like 2000, the, the Matthew Vaughan film. You know, he did like a layer cake and... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In Kick-Ass, he, go, he talks through his backstory and yeah. how his mum, they were just having breakfast on the dinner table, uh, on the breakfast table. And his mum, like, something just pops in her brain, she just dies. She no, has an aneurysm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> something pops in her brain. Yeah, and, and but so basically the mum, like, dies completely out of the Suddenly. blue. Suddenly. And then it dissolves into the breakfast table a year later. And it's him and his dad, but obviously the mum's missing. Yeah. And they're talking about the exact same thing. Mm. And it's so sad. It's like... Time oh, what? Well, it's trying to... Pre- yeah. It's trying to preserve... Something, yeah. but it's a sort of necromancy because those things are, those things are gone. You know, they should be in the past. There's a reason these things. You should leave things in the past. Yeah. But it's trying to preserve or distill a moment that. Do you know what I mean? It's reanimating something that should be dead. Yes. And that's what she's doing with her clinging onto her, her childhood belongings. Yeah. And that's what Seymour is doing, clinging onto his records. Yes. Because he has such an empty life. Yeah. Super but also, sad. but he's more afraid of change and being successful yeah and like meeting you know a nice girl yeah. than staying in a lifestyle that fundamentally depresses him he's yeah. aware of how depressing it is yeah interesting why do people stay stuck in their life it's a very, very profound question wow because they're terrified of because it's easy yeah it's harder to break out of something you're used to yeah you know Q Requiem for a Dream music. <laughs> um, can we talk about the art teacher? Mm, mm, yeah. Tampon and the teacup. Because that's so funny. Because, like, I, I mean, I did art in high school and I did an art A level. And the mm. reason I didn't get into uni the first year round, because, you know, I, I applied to go to York and I didn't get in because I got a bad art grade. Really? Yeah. So I had to change six forms, redo the art thing, and then apply the. You know, I had year. to go back to school for my art. Really? Like Enid. I actually, I've just remembered that. Mm. That's bizarre. So w- when I was 18, I sort of kind of ended up flunking a bit yeah. out of school a little bit. And I was That's very sort of mopey and, and right. kind of stomped around the art lab in my Doc Martens. Yeah. And I had to return when I was 19 and it was so demoralising. Yeah. Um, and I was very sort of frustrated in that environment. And I think yeah. I flunked out of that as well. By the time I got to York, they didn't really care. But... <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to sort of re retake it. So yeah. she, so that's something we haven't talked about. Enid has to retake an art class credit because she's messed up her yeah. final. Which is sort of like the, one of the first things um, that that makes her different from Rebecca, her friend, because yeah. Rebecca is already like looking for a job, whereas Enid it, is already regressed back into high school. Yeah, 
in the form of this summer camp thing yeah. where she has to resit an art uh, term. Well, it's like replaying the same track over and over again on the record. It's like she's reliving the year, same year of high school over again. You know, yeah. there's this, this r- repetition and, thing. And, and like, I, I completely understand that. that whole art bullshit thing. Because the introduction to that to that lesson yeah. is, you know, the, the, the art film where it's like <laughs> mirror, black and white, father, four by mirror. three, like repeating random <laughs> phrases. And yeah, like, it's a horrible a, sort of serialist. Yeah, uh, a picture of like um, like a, a, a doll baby like in a seven tumble dryer limbs, or something. Yeah. <laughs> something fucked up and like, stupid. And, you and, know, swinging light and terrible noir yeah. student and then film. It, and then the, the, that little... Art film cuts to the credits and it says the the Federation for the Advancement of Mature Women in the Arts. <laughs> the Struggling um, Artist Foundation. The Struggling Artist Foundation, why not me? Yeah. <laughs> Seminar forty three. And then the art teacher says, like, um, before anyone gets to meet me, I like to show this film to my yeah. students because Just to it really, show them what I'm all about. What I'm all about. Yeah. And they're like, what the fuck is this about? And, and there's a, a repeated her voice over the footage which is like, Mirror, father, mirror. Yeah, you know, it, navel it, gazing. Oh, it's pretentious. A, exactly, and you it's mentioned the height of pretentious. You, you put this in um, in a great way, where you said every art piece in this in that stupid little world has to have an essay to explain it. Yeah, you can't just look yeah. at an amazing photograph or painting and, and go. And it speaks for itself. And it's like, oh wow, this is about this or that. It's like if you yeah. look at anything, anything like um, Botticelli. Yes, Modigliani. Yes, all that stuff. You can look at it and go. It's technically. Yeah. Super impressive. Yeah, yeah, Their yeah. skill that went into that and they learned their craft. Exactly. And you can appreciate it from that point of view. And if you want to go a bit deeper, you can read into it. It's like that... Um, yeah, sure. What's that, what's that picture that was um, painting that uh, it's um, God in the heavens and he's reaching out to Adam and Adam's like laid back and he's all buff and naked and he reaches out to God. Is it some sort of neoclassical... Something like that. Is it Italian? Yes. Um... um I don't know the name of it, but probably it begins was, with the B. It's going to be one of the. It's used in a bunch of movies. It's used in Westworld. It where... wasn't Da Vinci, is it? Is it oh, da Vinci, yeah, actually. Something like that, like pr- true classical religious art. Yes. Which is all years and years of training to be able to paint like that. You know, real skill and dedication and grafting went into that, as opposed to modern art, where it's just like some coat hangers put together. Yeah. Ah, right. Okay. So. This is what it's called. Who's it by? Michelangelo. Michelangelo. And it's called... Is it called like The Fall from Grace or something? No, no, The, the Creation of Adam. Oh, uh, okay. And it's really cool because you have uh, God and all these like um, cherubs and other guys in the air. Yeah. And you have... The recording. The thing in the air. Got the little... The cherubs. Adam. Yes. And this whole... An all, uh, so, so basically you have God... And all we the make it around big. Him. We do it full screen. Yeah. And turn up the brightness on your laptop, because I'm very short sighted. So you see the shape that God is in with all the other people around him. But it's like an organ. It's no, it's the shape of a brain. Oh shit. And that's like the 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 beginning of the the back of the neck and the stem that goes down to the spine. Wow. And that's the big um, frontal cortex. The, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Brain. It's a brain. Oh wow. And it's basically saying that like. Inside every human's brain is God type thing. Imago Dei. What's that? Well, it's a slightly different concept, but yeah. Imago Dei, image of God, it's all about like the reflection of God in us. Yeah. Like as in we're, we're always embodying the image of God. And... That's really cool. You can look at that and appreciate it. Well, as, there's symbolism and, that, and there's subtext. And also there's skill and everything. And that's great, right? And that's different yeah. from the tampon in a teacup. Fuck. And there's from, that there, there's that know, sort of girl bullshit. that girl who's wearing like a bandana and she's like yeah, you know oh she's God. like a sort of a drippy hippie kind of well you know it's it's an art piece using found objects and the tampon represents and then the teacher chimes in and is like the horrific imagery of fe- repressed femininity in, in our society tampon. yeah sighing yeah so it's, hard. it's like I say it, it needs an essay next to it she uh looks at the book of cartoons Mm. That is Enid's, you know, kind of... Uh, diary. Her diary in cartoon form. And there's no accompanying essay because this stuff just speaks for itself. Yeah. It's kind of... It's skills cartoon work. Yeah. You know? And it's, and it's, and it's so fucking hypocritical of the, the yeah. art teacher to go, like, well, these are just these are, cartoons. Uh, they're just amusing images. Amusing images. 
They're not real art. They don't mean anything. And I had an art teacher like that who... Um, so there was, there was someone in my um, A-level art group. And she basically drew manga. Yeah. And that was her thing. And she just really liked manga. And it's all she drew. And she was amazing at it. And I she, had a girl in my art class like that She drew these enormous, too. like, six foot by four foot canvases of, l- like, 20, char- 20 people. Yeah. Uh, big, like expressive stuff of, of, yeah, of yeah, manga yeah. characters running around doing stuff um, and my art teacher was like yeah well it's just you know cartoons and their eyes don't look like real eyes I'm like yeah. it's like you're kind of being a bit hypocritical because that same person was perfectly fine with all the the, the tampon and the teacup yeah. type of art projects in our classroom yeah they conceptual were fine. art yeah when someone could come up with some bullshit things like yes this represents the struggle of Palestine and Israel, and yeah. like it's this is Jupiter stuff, and it's like, and, the, the and art, it's just a fucking. The bunch artwork of crap. is a piece of string on a table. Yeah, and and literally. Like, okay, so great. Yeah. Um, but they they look at cartoons like, oh, cartoons are not art. Yeah, you know? it's it's very strange sort of set of contradictions. Yeah. That's where we. This is the shipping news. Um, where were we? Art, the art class. Yeah, the art class. But. I feel like we haven't talked enough about Ina's relationship with Seymour. Yeah. What the dynamic is between them. Mm. Because you mentioned her, like, weak father. You know, when you first described the film to me, I thought, this is about a chick who has, not daddy issues, but she's looking for a father figure and she finds that somewhat Yeah, you, you mentioned the fa- she's looking for a father figure thing a few times. Yeah, she's, well, she's got kind of both daddy issues, but also mummy issues. <laughs> Because Rebecca kind of turns into the hostile mother figure. Yeah. A very sort of discerning, kind of cold. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and e- the character of Enid is just sort of unmotherable. She's kind of unparentable in a way. Mm. She's just so fucking difficult. Yeah. And you kind of don't blame the dad for being, for not knowing how to respond. Like, there's a really sad bit at the end where she's crying <laughs> and the dad sort of comes. In and tries to comfort and her. And he's like, he just do doesn't know what to about? do. But he, he's saying, like, you know, if you want, we can talk about it. Yeah. And she's like, it's just a hormonal thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a hormonal thing. Yeah. Bait, like, yeah. code for fuck off, please. But Seymour is, like, just as lonely as her. And there's this sort of quasi romantic kind of subtext to their relationship yeah you know she's really trying to she's help she's trying to help him she's got the facade of trying to help him get a date but she's very possessive when he finally does get one. Oh yeah she doesn't actually want him to meet another girl like she wants to be his girl yeah she wants well to that's be the what girl happens at the end with. where she come comes over to his house and tries and to says, sort of like, pathetically i just him. need someone not yeah. to be mean for me for five minutes <laughs> and then just like takes out the bottle of champagne yeah. and he's like actually we were saving that two know, week anniversary, two week anniversary <laughs> yeah. or something bullshit like that and she just like pops the cork and like knocks back yeah a the bottle of champagne. bottle of fizz. And then they sleep together. Yeah, and she really, afterwards, sort of, you know, it. sobers up and thinks, what have I done? Yeah. Because he, he then He's taking it seriously. Like, oh, fuck, I'm into this. I'm actually really, yeah. And then she kind of runs away. I mean, yeah. she really is a little girl pretending to be uh, Yeah, because I think that moment is. was like her realising that actually what she wants. And she's like, oh, fuck, I don't actually want to move in with Seymour. I just need to be not depressed. And like, yeah, so she has just... something to live for, you know? Well, and then she runs back to Rebecca and sort yeah. of tries to desperately, you know, plead that, please, mm. can I still move in? Yeah. At this point, Rebecca's just like, you know, she's got a job, she's on it. Yeah. You know, she's dressing in like... Adult clothes. Uh, you know, nice, like, office blouses and stuff. And she's got this dinky, my first apartment yeah. thing. With a fold-down iron board yeah. that pops <laughs> out of the <laughs> that kitchen That she's really excited top. about. Yeah. And this Enid suddenly panics and thinks, shit, I actually really do want to move in. After having told her that she doesn't want to move in. Yeah, yeah. Because that, that, at that point in the film, that she's running around to all of her options, going like, what do yeah. I do, what do I do, what do I do? So she goes to the She's art school. She's just sabotaging everything. Yeah, and she she goes to the art school. The, um, art, the remedial art class for yeah. fuck-ups and degenerates, <laughs> or whatever it well, is. Well, that's, that's she... what she says to her, her dad's um, girlfriend, yeah. where her dad's girlfriend's Maxine. like, oh, what have you been up to? Like, it's so nice to see you growing up and all this sort of yeah. stuff. And like, it's so sad because you can tell that she's like, that Trying. girlfriend, that her, her dad's girlfriend mm. is really trying mm. to like, hold this broken family together and just yeah. be sociable and like make an effort which I think is actually she's not even trying to be a mum figure she's just trying to be... take an interest yeah be friendly and I think that's such an important thing 
to do. And when yeah. people try that, I really think it's actually important to, like, encourage that Yeah, it's behavior. an olive branch. Yeah. Uh, that means so much nowadays. Like, yeah, no one wants to fucking. So many people are like, "Yeah, I'm happy just burning bridges and not talking to my family for fucking years." And, but she's know. so in it. She's so defensive. She, she can't. Yeah. She can't allow real feelings to yeah. touch her. Even though she gets to the point where she's like breaking down, yeah. knocking back champagne, and then sleeping with this forty-year-old yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And really making incredibly self-destructive decisions. Oh, yeah. She's sabotaging, self sabotage to the max, short of sort of taking heroin. You know, it's like every single thing yeah. that she has the chance to fuck up. It's she interesting does. that it doesn't, this film doesn't actually show anything like a drug habit. Yeah, or addi- it you know, it doesn't send them down the path of no. addiction or anything. But, no, it, but I think not... their version of addiction is like, it's about obsession, it's a film about obsession. It was almost like that scene now, The Dark Knight, where they're trying to explain the Joker's behaviour. Yeah. And Michael Caine's going like, and because some some men, Master Bruce, just want to watch the world burn. Yeah. Oh my god. Like, yeah, they just want to see what happens. Oh, can I just talk about his obsession with uh, blues music? Yeah, do. And stuff. Him and Enid yeah. go to um, the bar. And he brings his, like, his, his record, because he really wants to get it signed. Yeah, but... And there's knows. this old guy who looks like he's 90 years old and he's playing guitar and he's just singing this amazing like heartfelt yeah. song and it's like oh that's such like good music yeah yeah and he's in a bar surrounded by people who are playing pool and like watching, watching football on the on fucking the TV. tv and being really loud yeah and there's just steve buscemi in the corner going like i fucking hate this like i really yeah. want to pay attention to this amazing artist who's yeah. pouring his heart and soul out <laughs> through his guitar and there's some fucking idiot who spilt beer on me. And he ruins the chat up line by going into dwindling sort of obsessive technical description about the differences between blues and ragtime, and you just think, oh god, oh, yeah. Um, but, I, but Ina recognises that that he's he's got something cool about him, yeah. and she says, "There's that line where she goes, I can't." Yeah, he's like, "Why are you so fixated on getting me a date?" And she says, I just don't want to believe in a world where someone like you can't get a date. Like, she recognises this oh, quality yeah. as, as... That's really cool. That's like, advanced Yeah, in yeah that, that's, that's her saying, like... He has an advantage I, over I don't simple want to people. I live in a world that is completely nihilistic and cruel and hopeless. And she empty. Wants, and empty. She wants to but be... But she sees something real in him. Yeah, yeah. And I think maybe it's the only real thing. Because the rest of her life is about pretense. And... Dyeing her hair green and... But literally, she goes around in, in costume. Yeah. She's not authentic, you know, she's not dressing authentic. She hasn't really found her style. But it's so unfortunate for her because she has two relationships where she starts off on kind of equal punching ground with the other person. Yeah. And then that person almost like, because of her reflecting maybe traits in mm. them they don't like in themselves. Yeah. that th- Those people end up kind of floating away from her. Yeah. And not really wanting to... Be like her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of spooky, that. So basically, so the reason why Seymour loses his job at the end of the film, and why he gets pissed off and figures out that Enid and Scarlett, Rebecca, basically, the the reason he knows them is because they tricked him into turning up and getting... Yeah, they played a horrible prank. Horrible prank on him. And at this point in the film also is the reason that he's lost his job. Yeah, his life has just fallen to fall- <laughs> Yeah, it's so it's sad. Because of this one little... Because a teenager one, was going to be cruel to him, his entire life is fucked up now. So when Enid is, is talking to Seymour about his past and stuff, and he's like, oh, wow, look at this cool big poster Yeah. of, like, blackface cartoon. Yeah, it's, you know? it's, a, it's a grotesque caricature of a black man that was yes. the face of Which is the logo a diner that is on now a known diner as, from yeah. the 1920s called Coon's Chicken. That is now known as Cook's Chicken. Chicken. Yeah, yeah. That so, has a you know, white man as the face of it. Yeah. And she sort of spots it and says, can I borrow it? Yeah, can I borrow it for With an With a view project? to use it for in a Yeah, and class. he's like, oh, I don't know, like, I've been working for this company for, and that's the sad thing, it's like, years. I've been working for this chicken company but it, but not even, nineteen, not even years. in the restaurant. Like she, yeah. she, she was like, "What do you do? Are you a cook?" And he's like, yeah. "Nothing that glamorous. I just work in the office, like the headquarters, yeah. Yeah. assistant managing for nineteen years." I mean, that's just yeah. so fucking depressing. But he just has these old posters from like the basement, which he just kept, and he's this like, well, of, "I guess pa- this is mine now." Paraphernalia from the restaurant. Yeah, um, and then he goes through like the. Uh, uh, his little, his gay little scrapbook. His, his little scrapbook. <laughs> <laughs> 
shit. I love that. Um, well, again, it's like collectors, total yeah. geeky. So he's got this little scrapbook going through from the 1920s all the way through to the present day where you see their marketing change from Coon's Chickens to Cook's Chickens and you yeah. have the, 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 the horrible caricature, caricature yeah. turn into like a white guy. A smiling guy. girl originally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a white guy, then it turns into... into kind uh, of looks like Wendy's. A, you know? Yeah, Wendy's yeah. Or, or Denny's. Or, and turn. everyone has sort of forgot like how it started out. Yeah, that's like Seymour's work history yeah yeah she takes one it one of and... his research black holes yes yeah yeah and, and she takes it and puts it in one of her art projects and um her art teacher actually is like yeah quite taken it's... with it yeah it's great As a it's comment, like... a comment on racism yeah in and our she's culture. like really like keen on that idea and like saying how it's amazing and it's, it's great but all of her classmates are like saying this is rubbish and i, I don't like it because it's offensive and all this yeah. stuff so. And then all the teachers at the art. What like, is it like a gallery? Uh, no, a gallery evening is exhibition for the parents' work. evening, but like it's got yeah. Yeah, but she but because of it, she gains a place at the like some prestigious arts academy. No, don't they refund it because of that? Yeah, because of it, but but she, her work. But was, the fact that she's in it means that she gets the place. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's like really offensive to everyone, and then because of that, they find out they're, they're like, who could possibly have leaked or source this image well yeah, Seymour, yeah. This and then guy like, is the only one who yeah and Seymour's to... boss like Seymour just the man I want to see come into my office for a second oh, and then God. it just cuts to him in this therapy therapy session with someone and he says yep since my life fell to pieces fell to pieces it's actually starting to look up look now, up now. And, you know um... in the Lonely Hearts ad you know the girl that he originally reached out to Diane or someone Dana yeah. Dana yeah she she actually ends up calling him back and they end up actually starting to date and get on. And Enid oh, is, is like yeah, yeah. repulsed <laughs> at the idea of him, yes, yeah, you know, yeah. being in a relationship. She's sort of sque- both squeamish about it in the way that you would be if like, you know, your dad started dating someone. There's a weird parallel with yeah. that triangulation. Yeah. And then she's just very jealous because she wants to be the only woman in, in his life. Yeah. And she sabotages it. And he decides to break up with her, which is just like such a no moment. He breaks oh, up with yeah, her, he sabotages it. Oh yeah, he thinks it. that he's going to move in, that the, the Enid's going to yeah. move in with him, which tell, shows how like... Kind of immature he is in a way. Yeah, that he thinks this 16 year old or 18 year old girl is going to move in with this man. And she only says that because she's depressed and just needs Desperate someone and, to like yeah. hold her for like five minutes. and Yeah, until she sobers off and yeah. runs away in yeah. her silly red dress. <laughs> One of my favourite moments actually, like, is when she goes in, they go into this adult video, what is it, like a it's an adult shop. shop, a porn shop, and she's just like so loud, and it's like this sort of almost. Uh, we we should clarify that this film is set in like the nineties, before internet, before, the internet. before so, so it's like you know video rentals. And... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you have a, a a porn shop with loads of like guys in like cheap suits walking around like fishing like like really mm. silently. Yeah, <laughs> well, even how there's that guy who goes into the video rental store and is like. I want to hire out eight and a half by Fellini, and then yeah. the guy behind the desk is like nine and a half. That's in the adult section. Yes, with Mickey Rock from yeah. two th- or like whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, some pornographic act. But yeah. yeah, she makes Seymour in that shot by her like a cat. It's so fucking funny that what is she's it? Like, like a leather. She says like because you don't see it until the next scene. Mm. You just see her pointing at something, mm. and Seymour said, "And Seymour, you just like, see like PVC buy that. boots." And yeah, yeah, and she's like, "Please buy me that." It would yeah. be so funny. And then he's like, "I'm not going to buy. I don't want that." popping up my credit card bill or whatever yeah and the next scene is her like going up to rebecca at her new job which yeah is at the cafe and embarrassing her and embarrassing in this her mask by wearing like a cat a dominatrix mask. Yeah. yeah yeah so do Never you think comes. it actually means anything the fact that he got on a bus at the end of the film yeah i think it symbolizes like things have to change leaving the limbo of ghost world yeah and moving into the next stage of life i guess i don't know there's something uh Almost biblical about it, I guess. Yeah. Like, they're in purgatory. Yeah. And to leave on a bus like that is kind of almost transcending this horrible, mundane, limbo Mm. reality. But the place itself doesn't feel real either. Or the town they live in. Yeah. Yeah, you don't see a lot of outside their world. It's a complete microcosm. It's like they're in a bubble. Yeah, yeah, you never see, like, a a, a TV... Uh, something playing on the TV about like politics or um, current events. Well, or all of like the culture that we're shown is nostalgic culture that yeah. is being replayed. 
like an old record. Yeah, that's a really cool a cool idea. Or old Bollywood you, music. You don't see anything other than... You see nothing up to date. Old stuff played through sad, lonely people. Yeah. And that's really, like... But even how she's trying to bring sad. back the original 1977 original punk. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, you think I'm, like, playing at punk, but <laughs> yeah. I'm the original punk. And Don't she... you know what punk is? Yeah, she's... God, you're all so stupid. Got this stupid, like, dyed green hair and a leather jacket. Yeah. You know how he looks through her notebook and sees, like, her laughing at how pathetic he is? Oh, yeah. In the diner, and he thinks, like, that's it. And then she says, like, read the rest of it. And it's, it's like, a story throughout their relationship. And you sort of get... You, you sort of um, know that she's not... She's grown from being the malevolent... Male, malevolent? Malevolent? Male, you know what I mean. Mean. Malevolent. Uh, malevolent. Malevolent. Fuck. <laughs> she's not cruel anymore. You know how we're talking about how kids can be cruel. You know this. It's like, yeah. This the start. Of but also, she's a provocateur, which is cruel and product. Yeah, provocative. And and, and that. that comes out through her cartoons, which is actually the yes. function of a cartoonist, which is to yes provoke and rile up an audience. Yeah, yeah. For satirical humor. Yeah, yeah. And it actually also that is it was based off a graphic novel, I think. There's it's, a yeah, the comic book. Yeah, which I like, and there's constant. References to superhero, you know, she says yeah. to Seymour at the end, "Don't you you're realize my... you're my hero?" Yeah, exactly, because he's like the shittest superhero ever. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. <laughs> what like, is his um... superpower? Is his uh, he's his a knowledge? Nerd. Yeah, yeah. His, his information uh, capacity <laughs> in his brain. Yeah. But in in some way, he is like Thora Birch's hero because she just, you know, she's the one he goes. To. She he is the one that she goes to when she's feeling like at her lowest point. Yeah. Um, which you could you, you you could interpret as just her being desperate and at the bottom of the barrel, but yeah, in obviously in film and mm. you know she does care about him and she does think that he's some sort of hero to her. Um, yeah, the shittest superhero ever is, is yeah. Steve Buscemi. But his wife, it, yeah, his uh, and his kryptonite is her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that's so fucking depressing. His kryptonite is her and um and and ragtime. Records from 1978. Yeah, yeah. Poor Seymour. God, and his fucking, like, beige outfits. I mean, that is so 70s. But it's a revival. It's a 70s revival. I mean, his whole apartment is like a, sh- uh, a shrine to yeah. the year of all of his favourite records. Yeah. And he can't move on until everything is destroyed. And then, you know, it takes rock bottom. Yeah. Well, like, said, like at the end of the film, you can't move on until like Thora Birch gets in the bus and just leaves. Well, she has nothing left. She's yeah. she fucked her relationship with her. Yeah, with that's her a really good idea. High like best mate. Yeah, she 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 destroys. She's, yeah, in, or intentionally or unintentionally destroys everything. Well, she's sort of diabolical. Yeah, prolifically. Yeah, diabolical. so she has no art, future art career. She fucked up her job. In one day, because she was she had a she had an agenda, an yeah. anarchist agenda. She was like, "Fuck this! I hate she this." She was like, job. "Fuck consumerism! I'm not going to sell anyone, you know, popcorn. supersized value popcorn." Yeah, yeah. She screws up her friendship with her best friend from in high a school. really sad way. In a horrible. That's event. so yeah. real. Oh yeah, yeah. It's so something that happened like to me and a bunch of people I know. You know, yeah. that age. It's like you really think. This is my person, this is my best friend. You know, I'm going to know this person forever. Yeah. We're always going to have this dynamic. A year ago, you were their best friend. Of and, um, you know, you're so, so quickly you become strangers. I I, th- I think at the end it is like you've got to reach rock bottom and then you you are born into a new environment. And that's like the getting on the bus at the end of the film. It's like she yeah. has nothing left. Because I was going to say, is she a passive character? Does she just let things happen? But then mm. she does um do active things. Like yeah. she does instigate drama yes as a massive diversion mm. away from try, like sorting herself out yeah so she is active but she's like passive at the same time until really until the end where she's like i am gonna follow my dream and get on that bus but it's like a yeah, magical cause, ticket because she says to seymour like earlier in like halfway through the movie like her one wish is to is to wish that she could just get in a car or a bus or whatever like just just yeah. just get out of here and move and not tell anywhere where she, anyone where she's going and yeah. just leave it's weird though because thinking about the idea of ghosts or even her as a ghost first world no, but she's haunting you know she's haunting this town she's haunting her own childhood seymour yeah. also is like a relic or a ghost of the past yes and then it's almost like she is a i don't know how to articulate this She's almost a receptacle for other people's ideas. She's kind of a reflect. I mean, in many ways, she's like she's a reflection of things that are wrong in society, or she's a reflection of 
her fucked up parenting. Um, and she kind of holds all of those all of those ideas and expresses them. And it's like she finally embodies herself at the end. Like she finally comes into her own like physical being as yeah. a person. But she's she's really empty until the very end where she sort of comes into herself mm. and she is authentically herself because she's following a real authentic desire that she's had mm. for a long time, which is to, to leave. So she like becomes like a real, per- like she exits like the ghost mm. state in some way. Yeah, you can't live in a house full of trinkets from your childhood. Yeah, yeah it's ha- you're haunting yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. There's lots of haunting stuff. Ghost world. Cheers, is that the empty glass? What else did I, I Yeah, sorry, right? yeah I think we can wrap this up with... Collectibles. But I think just as much as Seymour is a collector of things, she collects people. I think Seymour, she collects Seymour as a thing. What do you think the message is? What do you what think do you the moral think of the story is? About? What do you think the moral of the story is, though? Um, is there one? Or is it just nihilism? Well, it, okay, it's like adapt or die. Um, because if you don't adapt, you're just left with like... You're a ghost of the past. Um, you get depressed and yeah. you become nihilist. Because this, this I, I really think this film is just about depression. And like, but is, there, can, is there one character in that film like, who isn't depressed? No. They're Apart all... from maybe the art teacher, but she's only... No, the art... she's, she's kind of... She's manic. She's manic. Yeah. She's manic to counteract the natural depression. Exactly. You know those uh, things That on is Facebook? expressed through her performance art. Yeah. You know those uh, like grids on Facebook where you have uh, pictures of different characters from movies and you're like, this is me on a Monday, this is me on a Tuesday, or like this. So you can have all the characters from Ghost World and says, this is the manic depressive. Yeah. This is the suicidal depressive. Yeah. This is the nihilistic depressive. Yeah. And like you can go through. They're all, everyone's depressed. And, and like, like you say, everyone walks around with like sloped shoulders. Really Everyone, interesting like, to look at the along, posture in just, that like, film. They're just fucking falling apart and they have no bones. <laughs> yeah. How, how, how you said that Scarlett Johansson melts like sludge into that sofa. Into the sofa in the background of a shot and she's blurry and yeah, just yeah, reading yeah. this newspaper. and just she's like she, a corpse. Yeah, she has no energy to like get up and be in, engaged at all. And I, and I do think that's the point of the film. It's like you, you, you need something. You need to make something of your future to like work towards. Otherwise, you're fucked. You're, you're really screwed if you, if you yeah. don't plan your future well and um, execute it. You know? Yeah, it's like yeah. Adapt, adapt or die, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's about, like, you have to make yourself look forward. To God. That's what, and that's what Ghost World is all about. <laughs> it's, a, it's such an amazing film. I'm so right. glad that you recommended it. It's good, me. isn't it? Yeah. It sums up a lot of things that, you know, each line is just so iconic. And says it just distills so many like complex ideas into very simple lines. Right, should we wrap this up? Great film. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Okay. Cheers, Noel. Cheers, Adam. Bye-bye. Bye.